how do people think about the future? The first thing is that they don't, <laughs> unless they have to. So there are all of these things happening demographically, socially, technologically, which are going to vastly change the landscape for retirees and everyone who services them. So for advisors, I believe that it's very important to anticipate what clients are going to want in the future and proactively adjust what they're offering today. And the Social Security Administration itself suggests that by like 2030, or 2034, somewhere around there, they will be insolvent. So this is their own forecast. People tend to gravitate towards a very dystopian view of where things are going. It's all about kind of a robotic takeover. So we've been prepared up until this point. The question is, what happens next? Because we can't do the way we were doing before. It's hard to think about the future. There's a few reasons for this. One is that there are just so many ways the future could turn out. Thinking about all of them would just take too much time. In fact, it would take all of our time. Uh, and because of that, it's aversive. The other reason people don't like to think about the future is because they're, um, frankly, afraid of it. A bunch of social, social scientists did a study. And when they asked a 58-year-old, do you think you'll be any different than you are now when you're 68? They went, no, no, I'm, I'm who I am, am, maybe a little grayer, a little plump, you know, but I'm who I am. Then they asked the average 68-year-old, you, are you the same person you were 10 years ago? No way, absolutely different, right? And so we tend to extrapolate the present and we don't think about the future very well. And it looks as though people don't care at all. But another way to look about at this is not that they don't care about it at all, is that they care about it so darn much they're just unwilling to think about it at all. And so they're just gonna go along with whatever the default is. And we see this in retirement savings as well. When an employer takes a new employee and assigns them to save 3% of their paycheck, you know, a lot of employees never change that because that's the default. If people just take the default, it's very hard to get away from that because it avoids all of this decision-making. It avoids all of this potential regret of trying to do something and doing the wrong thing, right? It's almost as if in some situations you would rather do nothing because then you don't regret it as much as like taking an active step and screwing things up. So there is always a risk of relying solely on external factors to guarantee your own stability in retirement we have to be responsible for ourselves and make sure that we're making the right decisions rather than just counting on this magically working out for us. So why do we ignore the future uh, when it's to our own detriment? We can speculate about that. We can, we can say that, you know, throughout much of our evolutionary history, there was no analog of saving for retirement. First of all, we didn't live that long. Um, we're living longer and longer. And it was easier to make day-to-day, meal-to-meal decisions, right? The, this range of planning uh, that was needed was shorter. How can we help clients prepare for the changes in the, in the future? As advisors, what we want to do is help our clients see past retirement, that 5, 10, 15 years beyond retirement, that's where they need you most. And if we can simulate the future for people, either through technology or by enhancing their imagination somehow, we take the future and we bring it closer. And when you have a close-up view of the future, then suddenly you're engaged uh, and you can make better decisions. So when you think about a technology like augmented reality, we're already reading about potential applications where if you have someone envision what their life might look like in an augmented reality space 20 years from now, it might actually impact their psychology and their appetite to make certain financial decisions. So just reminding somebody that they're going to get old, right, which is a way of simulating the future, showing them a picture, helps increase retirement savings. Now, some advisors might say, well, I can't do that. I'm not a computer scientist. I can't age progress a picture and show somebody how they're going to look. But there's good news there in that you can buy a smartphone app for a few dollars that will take a picture and age it rather well. 
Um, so you can show the client right there how they'll look as an older person if they're willing to go along with it. Will every advisor want to use this? Maybe not. But after hearing my talks, a lot of advisors have approached me and asked me, how can I do that? How can I do that thing that you did in your experiment? And if that appeals to you, then go with it. Um, you might be surprised at how many clients, in particular uh, younger clients, are comfortable, already comfortable, with the idea of augmented reality. Because we as humans react better to visuals than we do to just words. However, we have to think about what's the purpose of visualizing ourselves going forward. It's really to help us make better decisions today. When you say something and show something at the same time, it sticks much better. So we tested this in a very controlled setting. A lot of other advice you might be considering acting on has no empirical test. If there's some proof that this works and there is you know, a growing body of evidence about the effects of virtual reality, augmented reality on shaping decision making, then it seems prudent to follow the tested strategies uh, I've always said if you want to know what the future is going to look like, then ask someone who's already experiencing it. And that's the benefit that you bring to the table by working with people that are already in the future and where your clients are going to be. So when we look at the future of retirement, we first have to understand why the trends that are shaping it are happening. The baby boomers were born in 1946. There were 77 million of us born. There were 43 million in the previous generation. We, in around 1955, we had over eight work, current workers supporting each beneficiary. Last year, we had two workers, just over two workers supporting each beneficiary. So the risk, the risk of Social Security disappearing is that people have to have their own retirement plans so that they don't end up wiped out. And unfortunately, very few people do that. And if people in huge critical mass are going to be living to be centenarians or over 100 years old, well, then how can we expect someone to retire either comfortably financially or just out of sheer boredom when they are 55 or 65 years old? It makes absolutely no sense. Now we're really moving into high-tech society where... Uh, there's more demand for services, there's more demand for skilled labor, but it's changing the demand. And in so doing, creating a lot of frictional problems that can impact uh, people's certainty over their income moving forward. If you have less certainty about your income stream, to begin with, then you don't know how easily you can save for that retirement. So when we look at the future of financial advisors, the skills and competencies that are gonna be required to do that job are also going to have to change. There absolutely will be a place for advisors because trust is going to be a huge factor in the client advisor relationship. You know, we always say that if you define a luxury in basic economic terms, it's something which is in extremely high demand and extremely short supply. And in a world increasingly being automated, where we're used to dealing with, you know, art artificial intelligence, there is a luxury to having a trusted human relationship with someone who we know is listening to us and is then going to take that input and then spit out customized, sort of personalized information for us. Soft skills are still what ma makes us uniquely human, and that's what we're going to have to increasingly cultivate. They're going to want that personal one-on-one -on -one connection, but someone who really understands them and what makes them tick. For advisors that want to deepen relationships with their clients and earn their trust, helping identify what their needs are, uncovering their values, and helping their clients prioritize the values can go a long, long way. It is a way to mitigate fear, mitigate anxiety, help navigate someone effectively through very choppy waters. Um, because who knows if they're getting that sense of certainty from anyone else in their life. No matter how smart the technology is, no matter what algorithms it is crunching to try to figure out, for example, what are the best investments this person can make, it still cannot replicate the trust of a human and the cognitive adaptability of a human. And what advisors do so well is we add that that emotional kind of, that connectivity, that 
this is what has happened before. This could happen to you. This is what we need to prepare for. And you don't get that from artificial intelligence. Thank you.